They are three inductees into the 2020 Canada Sports Hall of Fame class, and they join us for a roundtable about game changers. Lori Kane, Sheldon Kennedy, and Duncan Campbell are here. Uh, we appreciate you making time, guys. Th this is a real important kind of topic because so much about an athlete and sport is using the platform for greater good and taking that step forward. I mean, Duncan, you are the creator of the sport we now call wheelchair rugby. Sheldon, you've changed the sports world conversation when it comes to abuse and people opening up. And Lori, what people may not know about your story is that in the early 90s, you actually had to go to court with the Canadian Ladies <laughs> Golf Association just to get proper representation on a team that you qualified for. Um, Duncan, I wanted to start with you because creating a sport uh, is, is an altogether different animal than perhaps anything else. Were there obstacles and hardships along the way to get wheelchair rugby onto the map? Of course there were. Um, for one, we started out with a name called Murder Ball, which didn't at that time set us in good stead with expanding the, the game. Uh, we had some blocks in, in large countries. We had a we had uh, the United States couldn't get going for quite some time because when it was called murder ball, it didn't have an able-bodied parallel sport, which in the U.S. was very, very uh, important for them to promote a disabled sport. And they wouldn't do it until uh, we had a parallel sport. And that was part of the reason of changing it to wheelchair rugby, changing the name to wheelchair rugby. But we had very few obstacles in Canada. I have to say Canada was so supportive and I think our society is that way in that we accept change and we promote change and we encourage change. And Canada supported this sport from the moment they saw it until it's now a Paralympic sport with over 40 countries involved and thousands of people getting benefits from it. Yeah, change can be difficult to attain. Uh, eventually, it seems that you reach the point where people embrace it, but to get there, it takes a little while. Lori, in 1992, uh, your qualifications for Team Canada, you met the criteria, and yet they didn't want to have you as part of that national team. What did it take ultimately for you to decide, I'm going to take this to court because this is the right thing to do? Um, well, <laughs> You've taken me back to a time that wasn't easy, for sure. Um, and I'll tell you, the whole thing would never have gotten started had my sister not graduated. Mary Lynn, um, my older sister, had not graduated, I think, a year or two before from law school. And that we had a lawyer in the family that was willing to ask the questions. Um, growing up in a house of athletes, um, my dad being um, a hockey coach, at the university, um, he just said, okay, tell me why again, we have a criteria and you're not following it. Um, unfortunately, Jack McLaughlin, who was the national team coach at the time, had passed away just prior to us getting ready to host, and Canada was hosting the World Cup and it, at Marine Drive in, in Vancouver. And, um, you know, it's funny, I remember once we got the court case going, it was heard on Prince Edward Island, and they went to the highest court, meaning they being, at the time they were referred to as the CLGA, so the Canadian Ladies Golf Association, not to be what it is now um, under Golf Canada's umbrella, but they went to the Supreme Court once we, they wanted, they did not want me on the team, I don't know why, um, I felt that as an athlete I had done what I needed to do, and I think as athletes that's that's what we want. We want to know what's expected of us. And if, and if I don't meet the criteria, then okay, I'm fine with it. But I did everything I was supposed to do. And um, unfortunately, they, they didn't like to like that. <laughs> Sheldon, on 2014, you were named a member of the Order of Canada, um, in part for your courageous leadership in raising awareness of childhood sexual abuse and your continued efforts to prevent abuse in schools, sports, and communities. Obviously, everybody wants their neighborhoods and their communities to be safe. But in the face of what was happening, 
to you and in the aftermath. How difficult was it to take the initial steps forward and point out what was going on? Well, uh, first of all, thanks for thanks for getting us together, Arash, and, and it's an honor to be uh, part of this uh, this group uh, of inductees uh, for 2020 with Lori and Duncan, and be part of the, the kind of the Sport Hall of Fame with with all the other um, you know individuals that have done just amazing things. And, and and I think when I look at you know I guess Sheldon's story or whatever it might be, um, you know I was in a position where I needed to tell my story um, to save my life. And, uh, and I felt that I was the only one that this had ever happened to and so forth. And, uh, and I found out quickly, um, you know, and 24 years ago, I found out quickly that uh, I wasn't the only one that this had ever happened to. And that the impact, um, you know, the incident was real. And that's where we really tried to put our focus is we really tried to focus on the impact. And, what we realized was that, uh, you know, what we were hearing early was that this was a hockey issue, it was, it was an isolated case. And what we know is that it's not a hockey issue, it's not a sport issue, it's a societal issue. And that sport is a platform to make shift and to make a great positive change uh, within our communities. And so we started to set out um, early on to educate coaches because what we found was that uh, uh, most people, um, we're not educated in this space and, and these issues that we represent abuse, bullying, harassment, discrimination um, they carry a lot of fear and people didn't even know how to broach that conversation so what we did was we set out to try to educate people and focus on the 98 99% of really good people give them the tools to be better and create a confidence around issues so that the conversation can be had and I think what we've learned over the last 24 years is that it's not about the incident. It's about what are people left with? And one of the most consistent aftermaths of, you know, any types of abuse and, and discrimination and so forth is, is the mental health impact. And that's probably one of the biggest things that we struggle with today is, is the mental health. We also know, and the science is clear, um, that one of our best medicines and best prevention tools for mental wellness and mental health is exercise. So sport plays such an important role, I believe, in our communities and across our country uh, for many reasons, not only to bring awareness and educate people, but also to uh, to deal with probably one of the biggest problems that we have on our hands in society today. This is Game Changers on Sportsnet with three members, three of the newest members of Canada's Sports Hall of Fame, three Canadian sports giants who have transformed their sport in entirely different ways. Lori, for you, fairness and equality. Duncan, for you, opportunity. Sheldon, for you, safety. But ultimately, I think where the three of you come together is not just sport, but it's about culture. It's changing a culture and a mindset of how people think and go about things. When you think about the three journeys that you have been on, what, what's been critical in, in changing a mindset and just the culture of how it was to how we can take this forward and make things better. Uh, Duncan, why don't we start with you and your sport as, as you were trying to get it off the ground from the jump? Well, uh, it was 40 years ago that we started this thing. And you have to realize that people with disabilities were not looked on as athletes and were not looked on as strong individuals. And murder ball with the hitting and the physicality of it gave us a forum or a platform to say, look, we're not fragile. We're not going to fall apart if you talk to us. We're not going to break down. And we're, we're as tough as we were before we got hurt and had a disability, and we're going to show you that. And it has, in my mind, I think it has changed uh, Canadian people and people around the world's perception of individuals with disabilities and what they can or perceived cannot do. Lori, I think your intention back 30 years ago was, I just want to play. I've earned my spot on the roster fair and square. But I think in the process, it opened the idea that, look, sports organizations are not judge, jury, executioner. We have to fulfill the criteria that has been set out. A hundred percent. I mean, I think back to that time. And as I said earlier, um, I wanted to know what I needed to do to compete on that team. Uh, and then a bunch of people got in a boardroom and made the decision or changed the rules in my backswing. Um, 
golf is, you know, golf is looked at as, as quite an elitist sport or has been, and it's changing and it's taking a lot to change it. Um, but I'm from the smallest of our provinces and I think that that was a problem. Um, sometimes we forget there's a life on the other side of Montreal and Arash, you know how the Maritimes are. We, we stick together. And um, so moving forward, I, I just, you know, I'm, I know there's a, the whole legal thing is in a, in a document and uh, having lawyers in my family, they say, if there's a sport case, our case is now being uh, referenced. Um, I hope what I did was I encouraged people to ask the question why and why not. Change is not easy, but I will make sure that um, anybody who wants to ask the questions will be given the answer. I mean, taking on the establishment is so daunting. And it was. That, yeah. <laughs> it was. <laughs> and Sheldon, doing so when you're exposing some of the dirty secrets is on another level of its own. Well, yeah, and I mean, you know, it's just, uh, just impressive listening to uh, Duncan and Lori here talk. But, uh, you know, I think for us, um, you know, we there's two roads to go. We felt that there was two roads to go down. Let's, let's try to work together um, to make a difference so that this doesn't happen to other kids. Or, you know, we go down that other road and, and you know, which, you know, we drag this thing through courts and, and all that. And I felt that, you know, for us to make a difference, we needed to work with organizations. So if you think about it, you know, every sport organization across this country, and we've spent 24 years trying to um, create mandatory training uh, for coaches and, and now parents um, for, to educate them on these issues and what to look out for. Because most cases that we've investigated, um, which we've investigated many, not just in the sports world, but uh, through the Child Advocacy Center, um, um, the, the child knows their abuser and there's bystanders. So our best defense is to empower the bystander. So to convince a sport organization that it's got to be mandatory to train all of your coaches um, before they can get behind the bench or on the pitch or in, uh, it is, is a task because most people don't think that these problems uh, took place uh, within their sport organization. So, you know, it, this was not Sheldon. There was a lot of great leadership across this country, leaders in sport that said, you know what, this is critical. Uh, we have to make sure that we're creating the best, uh, the best place for our athletes and coaches and parents to be uh, a part of. And, uh, you know, and today we've trained over 1.4 million uh, coaches uh, and parents across this country. Um, and that has, you know, and, and that has morphed into schools and, and into the workplace. And I think, you know, when I look at sport, um, yeah, it was a, it was a, you know, a story that wasn't, you know, definitely hockey wasn't proud of. Uh, but I think what's come out of it is that uh, we, we are in a better place and it's shifted society, it's shifted the way we understand these issues and, and, and understand the impact that these issues have within the individuals um, when we're not taking care of them. So, um, you know, that's, that's what I'm proud of. And I think I'm proud that, uh, uh, I'm proud that we had strong leaders within all types of sports across this country said that, yes, you know what, this is important in our organization. We're going to, we're going to do something about it. And, you know, to me, hats off to them. I mean, you know, Sheldon, this is not just about Sheldon. I can tell you that. It's interesting because in 2020, I don't want to say that we take how things are now for granted. They've just become a way of life that we now accept. Not only just accept the Paralympic Games are a few weeks after the Olympic Games. It's just how it goes. Wheelchair rugby is one of the sports involved in it. Um, that we know that when coaches are signing up to be, uh, you know, mentoring, grooming, working with young children, they have to go through a protocol that when it comes to who's going to make the team, especially in an individual sport that scored, the best player is going. Um, to, to go from where it was to where it's become, what, in each of your sports or in each of your uh, domains, what have, where have you seen the biggest growth and the most important part of it, uh, Duncan? I would say in the uh, athletic attitude of the players in that, 
the sport started out very much as a social sport experience. It's now morphed into maintaining that social sport experience in, in communities and in clubs, but it's morphed into the Paralympic sport where people are training their butts off to make their national team and then working their butts off to win or medal at the Paralympics. It's, it's, that has changed tremendously from the start to the finish. And it's a fantastic thing. And I have to say the other thing that's, that's been very helpful is that we've had many, many people develop this sport. And there was no money involved. Nobody was getting paid to do anything initially. And it's rare that people get paid now even. But uh, people have put their time and their effort into it, not just me for sure, to make this sport grow. And it has, and it still is. We're starting to grow in places like Thailand and India. And we're looking everywhere. Lori, it struck me Rio 2016, seeing golf at the Olympics to, and, and Brooke Henderson's competing to see how far things have come. For sure. And I, I mean, I was somebody who felt golf should have been in the Olympics a long time ago. Um, and even in the pair games as well, um, there's able-bodied golfers and, and challenge golfers. I've watched blind golfers play that totally amaze me um, and how they can, you know, contact with the ball. I, I have two good eyes and sometimes miss it. So um, the change that's coming in golf, the, being an Olympic sport has really changed the dynamics of it because now it's making golf accessible to uh, a lot of countries that didn't have golf before. Um, I continue to say this, we can do better in Canada. We can have more kids playing golf and golf is a sport that you can play for a lifetime. Um, I think Sheldon talked earlier about how important sport is uh, mentally, physically, just to your personal well-being and health. And my game is, is perfect for that. Um, you can play it alone or you can play it with friends. Um, and there's nothing that challenges you more than trying to hit the golf ball. And um, I say I challenge myself every day, me, myself, and I, as to who's going to be the leader. <laughs> and I hope it's usually I. <laughs> but um, no, I, I think there's, we still have a way to go. Um, I'm excited as heck that uh, I've been given this order of sport. Uh, because it just allows me to uh, to keep doing what I'm doing and the partners that I'm involved with, uh, you know, Canadian Pacific and what we're doing with Heart Health and, and all of that kind of stuff, they've given me a vehicle and I'm going to keep riding it. Sheldon, we've come a way in terms of opening up people's eyes about abuse in sport. How much more is there to go? When my story broke, um, you know, and if you had a prevention program in place in any organization that you were part of, that meant you had problems. Whereas, you know, where we're at today, if you don't have a play prevention program in place, we're not signing up. And that's the cultural shift that we've had. And this is not just about sexual abuse. This is about, you know, respect. And this is about how do we treat one another, you know, and do we know, you know, what to do if, if we witness something and, and, uh, we have come a long ways and there, I don't think that there is a finish line when it comes to this stuff. I think we'll keep learning. I think we'll keep getting better. Uh, and I think that's what we have to do. But, you know, I, I, I think one of the biggest shifts and one of the biggest cultural shifts is the value that's been put on um, uh, the importance of, you know, the safety of athletes, coaches, administration, uh, and, you know, and obviously if we can create that environment, we're going to get better players if that's ultimately what we want. But I think it's about, you know, it's about making sure that Johnny or Julie come back, uh, to, to that sport the next day, they leave, uh, with a smile on their face and we keep them involved. And, and that I think is absolutely critical. I mean, you know, we, we've just launched a program with, with Jumpstart about keeping girls in sport, right? That is we lose a, a tremendous amount uh, of young female uh, athletes. Um, and so to me, I think that it's just going to keep, keep growing and keep, you know, we need to really be able to, you know, keep kids involved in any sport and all sport uh, uh, across this country. And I think that that's critical. And all three of you have as innovators, 
as leaders, as athletes, uh, game changers, and now Hall of Famers. Duncan Campbell, Sheldon Kennedy, Lori Kane, we appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you.